JP Nurbin is our guest here today. JP, why don't you introduce yourselves to your audience? Yes, um, I currently live in Dublin, Ireland. I'm a sports consultant. I work with colleges, high schools, uh, mostly directly with coaches um, all across uh, the US, Canada, Ireland, UK, largely on culture development, developing a culture that really at the bottom line is transformational, it's changing lives and it's built on really strong relationships and high standards. JP, you were a uh, basketball player at the University of South Carolina and you earned a teaching degree and you jumped into the profession of coaching at various levels. What did you learn from these coaching experiences that led you to devote your career to building leaders and supporting culture development? Well, my, you know, my, my journey is, is unique because I started coaching in Ireland and, um, you know, was very, being an American over there was quite popular, you know, not that I could coach well, <laughs> but <laughs> just that I knew. And then I was enthusiastic and I was passionate and, and uh, some people got excited about that. So I got a lot of opportunities at a very young age to coach a lot of teams and the way they structure sports over there, it's largely club based. And, you know, you're not practicing with the intensity that maybe many of our American sports teams would practice at. you know, you'd practice two, three times a week. And so I was able to coach multiple teams at a time. Um, I would coach club level under 16s and 18s that I'd during, you know, in the evenings, early in the day, I might be coaching schools basketball. Um, and then I also added on some semi-professional men's women's collegiate experience so I was I actually counted it up and over a span of uh, 10 years I actually coached when you actually coached um, 40 43 teams uh, 43 seasons so I got a lot of experience in coaching and I think the thing I was always drawn to in coaching uh, was less of the tactical I just really liked building the team and I was really really passionate about that but I wasn't really good at it I didn't really understand how to do that and I just kind of wanted to build the kind of the culture that people wanted to be a part of and they enjoyed the experience. I really struggled at different, at different times. Definitely when I moved back to the States and started coaching in Tennessee, I really, really struggled uh, to, to build my team's culture there. And I had some unique experiences of just my own failings as a coach to really connect with my players, uh, you know, just, just getting guys that were leaving the program um, because they weren't enjoying the experience. Uh, when I when I felt at those times initially in those moments I was really trying to do things the right way I was holding guys to high standards and, and I really kind of blamed the culture at the time the culture that we live in and uh, and I kind of that was kind of my 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 theme for for a little while and um, there were some other things that happened in our community that really kind of drew you know caused me to sit back and reflect on do sports actually really build character? And, you know, I came to the conclusion that the sports don't build characters. So I want to be more intentional about that. And kind of all, all these different things were going on. And, and really, it came to this point where I hit rock bottom in coaching, where I was like, I think I'm done. You know, it's something I love for a long time, but I'm not building relationships and I'm not building character. And I just kind of had that moment of, of realization that I was really, really struggling there. So that caused me to really just, dive deep and work with a guy named Jill, uh, Jamie Gilbert who worked at Train to Be Clutch for a while and co-authored the book Burn Your Goals and he was a mentor of mine and he helped me through a really difficult time to kind of get back on track and realign with my purpose. And I think the purpose of every coach that gets into coaching, it's, it's always to, to make a positive difference. But like so many coaches out there, I, I got lost along the way and, and uh, Jamie was, was huge in my life and then I just decided, you know what, it was such an incredible experience. Uh, the, the, personal changes and the changes with my team that I want to start to do that for other coaches out there and, and across across the country. Now, JP, from your past experience, what's been the biggest cultural or leadership development issue that our coaches and players are facing today? And what do you believe is the root cause for it? I think the big thing is we are caught up in effective, what we deem as effective coaching um, techniques. And, and, and its strategies. And we confuse effective with beneficial, what's good for the person in the long run. And many of these effective strategies, they were effective with us. They came from our experience as a player and how we were coached. And then they also come from maybe some of our past experience as a coach. And so I think just as a basic principle, many times what I see from, from coaches and leadership and the way we run, run a lot of teams is we're stuck in, 
very old school me- me- methods of, of motivating, of, of, of you know, de- designing our, cult- our culture of our team. And um, we have to really sit back and reflect on, does this help the person in the long term? Does this help develop a team that's intrinsically motivated? Does this empower leaders on our team to actually lead? You know, I think that's one of the biggest, you know, that's a big misconception there is that leadership is developed in a classroom. And I'm a big advocate of certain things being taught in leadership, but leadership development, you know, is different than teaching leadership. And so you have to empower leaders. So I think there's a lot of effective things short term that coaches do around their own coaching behaviors. Um, you know, we, we can dive a little bit more into those things uh, of, of what those are and how they set things up and how they communicate to their players and how they, you know, enforce standards. Uh, but but that's a big misconception it's just, just because of what I'm doing is working right now in the moment is that it's good for them in the long term. And that's not the case. And JP, you just touched on this a little bit. What are some ways we can coach character within the confines of our sport and activity? Yeah, the big thing I, I would first encourage coaches is to start to see character as a skill, just like every other skill you're trying to teach. Like you have to see it that way. I think so often – um coaches you know i know that i said this a lot i was like hey you know you guys come in here you know it doesn't matter if you're how good you are or that if you work hard and you have a good attitude i'll work with you well that, that was kind of my, my my mantra i know it's a lot of other coaches like hey i'll work with the guys that want to, that have the, the work ethic and you know they have the positive attitude well positive attitude and work ethic th- those are skills just like in basketball developing a left hand you know kid comes to me doesn't can't finish the left hand layup or Kid on the football field doesn't know how to run around. Like, it, there's certain things that have to be developed, and then uh, some players they're underdeveloped um, significantly more than others. And so we have to really first off see those. What often I think is obstacles, like the attitude and effort, and uh, you know those those type of character traits in our athletes, not as obstacles, but just opportunities. They're opportunities to, to help kids where they're at. And that's, that's and when you, you have to first see it from that, that standpoint, because it, it's really changed. It starts with a, a shift in our heart posture toward, towards athletes and, and to kids. Like so often we just, oh, if you just would work hard, you would just do what I add. You know, if you just had a positive attitude, that would be so awesome. Well, how are you working on those things? So some ways that we work on that are our are, are transformational discipline is a big one. How we communicate standards, how we establish standards, how we reinforce those standards. And then how we enforce those standards within our program is really, really important that we're very, very intentional. And the other thing is um, what I would say is emotional intelligence development. And we have some strategies around that that I'll I'll share a little bit later. I know you want to get to that, which, you know, around tactical empathy, connecting with our kids before we can actually correct them. You know, so I think so often we try to discipline, we try to fix kids before we've actually um, gotten in there and actually connected with them. So those are some really important principles, I would say, on when it comes to characters, because, you know, is, when we talk about emotional intelligence a lot, that is, you know, the, the, the brain, you know, it's, it's, it's almost just like a muscle in the ways that it's developed. You know, so if, kid, if we have a kid that's self, really selfish, I mean, this is fascinating stuff. If it, there's a part in the brain called the temporoparietal junction. And this is often what, what scientists would call the, the empathy center. Our ability to empathize with other people is determined upon the, the temporoparietal junction, the TPJ. If it's not active, it's not being repeated in use throughout life, it's not going to be developed. And so by working with players, let's, let's just say from a character, if we want to get guys that be more selfless, we have to use questioning. And that's what I kind of my first kind of strategy I'd share with, you, with, with, with the listeners is you use questioning to get kids to think about how the other people might feel in that situation. We don't tell them, you know, hey, you're being selfish. We don't tell them like that was, you know, mean or whatever, but we're really stepping in there and going, how might they feel? So we use questions to get them to step back and to self-reflect. So uh, use, the use of questions really to, to have people become self-aware of their behaviors and not just even whether they're being selfish or not, but other things as well, using questions to get them to self-reflect helps them to acknowledge where they're weak at and then be able to start to self-correct moving forward. 
You know, JP, you know, oftentimes coaches may feel like, you know, they're struggling to constantly motivate their players and get them to the desired level of attention and commitment that is needed to reach their goals. So what are some of the common mistakes we are making as coaches when attempting to motivate our players? Well, this kind of comes back to the, you know, your, your character thing in, in some ways because, and also what I was saying earlier around effective versus beneficial we use eff effective ways to motivate extrinsic motivators, punishment, rewards, characteristics on to, to motivate our individuals instead of actually focusing on the environment and the culture. And that's really, really um, important that we actually just focus on, are we developing an environment that supports and nurtures intrinsic motivation where they're motivated from within? I think often, if we could just stay out of the way, I think so often we insert ourselves into co uh, into coaching, and we we're actually blocking, we're actually hindering their abilities uh, to to motivate themselves. But one of the big things that we work with in programs at the in, within basketball and and soccer and hockey and you know, Pete Carroll uses it in football. We use the competitive cauldron, and uh, we've we've developed that system extensively, and it, it looks a lot of different in different teams, but essentially. Uh, we really believe in just, you know, charting wins and losses within the practice session, you know, and leaving that as um, it's just, just, it's not something that's brought a lot of attention to. It's just the rankings are posted um, on where people stand. And uh, that's just right there. Guys want to, or girls want to be at the top of that. They want to win. They want to be up there and just posting that just as a simple way of creating that, that intrinsically motivated environment. The other thing is, you know, we'll talk about some of this a little bit later too, is, but it's getting players to set the standards based around the outcomes they want, the experience they want to create for each other and themselves, and who they want to become as a team. And by using the identity of, of who they want to be as a team, getting them to set that out and, and map that out, and then through uh, take them through a process of determining the behaviors that match up with that. So here they've set their, their vision of who they want to be. They've identified the process that is going to get them there. And then you talk about a, really a support and accountability system where, you know, how they're going to actually support each other, how they are going to take personal responsibility themselves, and also how they want the coaches to hold them accountable to those things as the last line of defense. But you have the conversation that, hey, it's first yourself, then it's your teammates, when accountable and when those things don't happen then we have to step in and, and but you that process there there itself is very intrinsically motivating because kids the athletes see the vision where they want to go they're very articulate and they see the process behind that and you can just come back to hey who do you want to be who do, what type of experience do we want to have and you just keep coming back to the process so it's very little extrinsic type of stuff we're just more guiding them along the journey as they're moving, um, moving throughout the season. To kind of touch on a little bit, you talked about the individual accountability and how that can be intrinsic. What if it doesn't ever get there? You know, what if we get to the last line and, and there has to be a discipline? Uh, and and di discipline looks different for everybody and it can be difficult, um, especially for coaches. Uh, what advice would you give coaches when it comes to developing and administering discipline? You know, why still, I would say, you know, providing that environment where it is intrinsic and player-led and team-led uh, and the culture is still intact. Yeah, th and this, I'm, I'm really glad this question came up because this is important because this ties back to the character thing. And honestly, I didn't get nearly specific enough. And I'm excited to share very specifically what this looks like, okay? Because the character stuff, development and the, and the motivation is very much tied to transformational discipline and how we do this, okay? There is this establishment of standards of how we do things in our programs. I advocate, and how you create those standards or how you create, it's not rules, it's standards. How you create those looks different for everybody, but I advocate three non-negotiables as a coach. For instance, my non-negotiables as a coach are very, very specific, very clear behaviors that are observable, which are be on time, listen, and don't complain, right? Those are so clear. They're not work hard, have a good, like that's way too broad. They're very, very specific. And they're necessary for me to maintain an environment where I can move the culture forward, where I can move the team forward. If guys aren't showing up in time, they're not listening, and we got complaining, those three things just will kill 
the environment that I try to create in a, in, a, in a practice session or a team meeting. So I have to have those in place. Everything else, I would leave to my players. I would call them in. We, have, we do this with various teams in various ways. But like I said earlier, set the vision. What's the process? What are the standards around that? We really drive towards not generalities of, hey, we're going to come in and practice and work hard. Like very specific. Like we're a type of team that shows up. 10 minutes early, and in that 10 minutes, we're putting in the work. Now, we don't do a list of 50 different behaviors. We try to get to five behaviors that, you know, around that five, 10 max that are really going to drive the program forward. They're specific to how we practice, how we play games, how do we meet as a team, how we are in the classroom, um, how we are in the community, where we try to get really specific, knowing that we're not going to encompass everything. So once we've established standards that are player-led and coach-led, then there is a process of enforcing those standards like you said when they're not doing what they should be doing and this is, is important we'll talk we'll touch i always say there's there's got to be advocacy before accountability we're talking about advocacy and how we do that in a second but the accountability piece is, is very important when you set those standards you talk about practice is a privilege playing the games is an opera you know, is, is a privilege practice is an opportunity to get better you have to come back to that as your foundation this is very, very important because I, I'll just give, share this experience of my own. Like when I was in, when I was in um, sixth grade, I, I probably got like a C on a test. My mom called up the coach, said, Coach, sorry, he won't be at the game Friday. Keep, he got a C. You know, we're at a, our family, we get A's and B's. He'll be back to basketball when he gets his grades up. Now, my mom didn't yell. She didn't scream. She didn't beg. She didn't plead. She set that standard up. You get A's and B's when you go to school. If you don't, you don't play sports. And so when I got that seat, she just pulled me right off the team. Well, I had that grade up a week later. Next year, I'm a slow learner. <laughs> so I'm playing football. First game of the year, I'm awesome. You know, I have four touchdowns. Anyways, bad news comes F in Latin, right? Next week, she calls up the coach. Coach, sorry. He's not going to be your quarterback for some time. And she didn't yell. She didn't beg. She didn't plead with me. She just enforced the standard. And then she actually sat with me every night for like two weeks helping me get those grades back up. So it wasn't just, you know, and it, the accountability without the support. There's the support there. I, I tell that story because it's really, really important. Because what I learned in that moment was not only that my mom meant business, not only was that that, that standard was going to be enforced, but I learned that basketball and sports were a privilege. I wasn't entitled to them. And the way we discipline can reinforce that. Like we talk about entitlement with athletes constantly. It's just a, that's, that's, you know, if you ask most coaches, what's the problem with, with athletes say, they're going to say entitlement. Well, we've made them entitled because we don't ever enforce consequences. We put them on the line, we make them run, but we still play them on game day. They still get the shoes. They still get the uniform. They still get to get hop on a plane to go to their AAU or whatever tournament. Like they're still getting all these things. The parents are afraid to enforce these standards with, within their own home. You know, it's just because they need they need that sport because it's one of the opportunities that it's providing for them, you know, and there's just such a misaligned value. So the big thing is establishing guys. If you don't work hard, if you don't do these things, you're going to lose that privilege. So in the practice, if a guy's not working hard, we don't yell, we don't scream, we don't beg, we don't ask. We just remind them, Hey man, where's your effort at right now? And most time kids will be honest. They'll be like, eh, not too good. All right. Well, that's not where we're, that's not who we're about. That's not what we're about here. So you have to, you're going to have to pick it up. If you don't, you're going to sit out. You know, you, you help them to self-correct, but they don't correct. You just say, man, we'll see you in the next drill. We'll see you in the next drill. You know, and if they can, that's a repeat offense. You know, rarely in the programs I work at, <coughs> sorry, rarely do the programs I work with, do guys sit out practice, but, you know, sometimes that's a result. If a guy's not at the acceptable standard of the game, he just comes out. He sits down. When, and, and when do you put that guy back? And when he's unacceptable, when he's a behavior on that sideline, is what you defined as an acceptable behavior, is encouraging his teammates or however you, however you set that. So they have to be able to self-correct before they can get in there. It's, it's an opportunity. It's a privilege. You come back to that. That's not just going to build character. That's not just going to maintain and raise the standards of your program. It's actually going to build an intrinsically motivated environment because they'll start to see every day as an opportunity to get better. But we do the opposite so often. We put them on the line, we run them, and which is supposed to be, you know, conditioning is supposed to be good for them. But we send all these mixed signals. 
Now, kind of to build off that a little bit here, uh, there are several times throughout the course of a you know, season where high stress emotional situations will present themselves and, and we as coaches are thrust into a very coachable and teachable moment. Since our athletes and coaches may not always have the best control over their emotions in the moment, what are some of the strategies you have for coaches to guide them through these emotional moments? Yeah, we're really big on this and I, I could talk for hours on this, but I'll, I'll give you a couple, couple simple ones here. Um, one is what we call some strategies around tactical empathy. And we've, we've used this from FBI negotiator, uh, Chris Voss. Um, he's in his, uh, black swan group, you know, he does consulting out there in the business world negotiations, but it's all based in, uh, the science around emotional intelligence and the stress response system of the limbic system. And I'm not going into the brain science here, but basically before we can help, before we can correct, before we can correct we have to connect. If I try to come in and correct a kid for a mistake he made out there or for an attitude, right? Whatever it be, you know, behavioral type of thing or, you know, just teaching him something. If he's having an emotional response, if he's having a stress response, if he's very emotional, right now I cannot, can, I can't teach him because the, the lower, the limbic system, which is the lower parts of the brain, it, in those emotional responses, it cuts off and, it cuts off the communication to the upper parts of the brain, which is the higher cognitive functioning parts of the brain. So <clears throat> we have to connect with them. When we do that, it calms that stress response, and then we can connect to the upper brain. Then we can help them in those moments. So how do we connect? Right? There's, a very, there's a few simple things. Uh, there are a few reactionary ways. Like let's say they're in the emotional moments. A few reactionary ways um, is, is one is kind of the use of questions, open questions, mainly using what and how. You know, you know, what are you seeing out there or uh, what's going on out there? So just some simple things of, of just using questions. And Chris Voss, um, like I said, he, he's, he's, he's phenomenal at this stuff. If you can pick up Never Split the Difference, it's a great book with a lot of his strategies in there. But he calls it labeling. And it's just simply, it's, it seems like you're frustrated because, well, whatever reason it might be, it seems like you're frustrated because, you know, the, the referee made three really bad calls on you there. You know, now I'm not justifying his behavior, but he feels understood. Like I'm saying, I understand, but we don't use personal pronouns in that for various reasons, but we just say they, they feel understood. They feel seen and they feel heard. Their frustration, um, it, you know, is, is, is out there, right? So in that moment, those type of things can help them to, to, to calm, uh, help us to calm that, that limbic system there. You know, I, I'll give you an example. Like I started to use this later on. In coaching, a kid, I pulled a kid out because, you know, he was having an argument with a referee or he was saying stuff back. The first thing I would do is I'd just say, yeah, it's, it's really tough. I mean, that, those are some really questionable calls, aren't they? You know, I'm not starting with like, you got to cut that, you know, you got to stop talking back to the referees. I'm just saying, like, I understand. I see you. I see that you're frustrated. And, and that's, that's so often what the kids just need. Now, sometimes we got to add a little bit of time. They may need to sit on the edge of the bench and then they're going to come talk to us and stuff. But you know, just trying to connect with them in those moments is huge. And then we can help them to correct. The other thing I would say is before, is more proactive strategies. And when we do this with teams, it is trying to anticipate the conflict, the obstacles. This is so, so, so stinking important. Before the game, as a coach, before practice, if you can help guys to anticipate what are going to be the things, their triggers, you know, and, and getting guys reflect on, hey, what are the things that really – are those triggers that triggers to that stress response that gets you emotional and that they can identify it. Hey, it's, you know, it's when I miss a few shots or, you know, I make a few bad passes or, you know, whatever it be, a few bad calls from the referees or coach pulls me out of the game. Okay. These are your triggers. Now, what is the best way you want to respond in those? So, because those things are going to happen, you're not going to play perfectly. So we ground their expectations. And this, this is important from the emotional intelligence, intelligence point. We're grounding the expectations, but then we're also helping them to see opportunities in that moment. Hey, you have a few, you know, you got pulled out of the game. How is that an opportunity for you to be a good teammate? So ground expectations, help them to uh, change the way they view some of these failures, some of these obstacles, some of these triggers, not as problems, but as opportunities. And, and lastly, I would say this, this is probably one of the most important things. And before you can do all this discipline stuff, you have to have a relationship and a relationship that's founded not in their performance, not with the player, but with the person. 
because if they always feel like they have to perform to be worthy of respect or love or care, then they're going to always feel a certain amount of pressure. And if we, but we've built a relationship where you connect with a person, then you all, they will, all the studies show if there's a relationship, they will, they are much more likely to retake your feedback. They're much more likely to listen. You know, that, that's on, that's the number one condition for feedback to be effective is there's a relationship. If there's no relationship, they, people rarely take any feedback. So those are just some strategies, labeling, use of questions, uh, be proactive and just kind of setting the expectations and, and helping them to, to see those problems or those challenges that come up a, a, as opportunities. We've spent a lot of time talking about uh, the, your team and players and, and coaches and everything within your program. And, and one part of every team that coaches probably don't necessarily enjoy as much as, as um, they should or could are uh, dealing with parents today. Oftentimes, it gets painted in a negative light, whether it be on social media, you know, in a community, within a school. What advice or strategies would you share with coaches for navigating the issue of dealing with parents? Before, you, before I give you any strategies, John, number one, that we have to change the way we view the parent and we have to ch ch change the way that we view our role. I really believe the transformational power of coaches. I really do believe in it. But if we all look at the number one influences in our lives, we'll always say our parents. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, we have to be able to connect. And there's parents that are nuts out there. There's parents that are absolutely crazy. But if we really want to help that kid, maybe we, through, through our interactions, we can help move the needle. I mean, we're probably not going to change the, the whole situation, though I've had some co coaches that have really taken some of those absolutely crazy parents and really moved the needle. And then we've also seen some failures there. But we really encourage coaches to start seeing parents um, as our biggest asset. And really, honestly, that we're an extension of whatever happens at the home. If we want to develop character, we want to empower them. So the first thing is to just, and also just to see them as people, not, not as the problem. All right. And that's it's so easy. It's, and I've, I've been stung so bad. I've had so many bad interactions with parents. It's painful. You know, you work so hard, you sacrifice so much as a coach with time with your own family. And then you get some of these people that are really ungrateful. So I get it. Like, it's not easy, this, this approach, because we have been, we have, we have a defense system when we, when we see parents so often as coaches. So but I mean, just a few strategies I think were really helpful. I mean, we, we truly try to be really transparent. Weekly emails, uh, just kind of communicating various things around our program, not just beyond the schedule. You know, share an article about, you know, something that you might be sharing, talking about with the team. Share an article on um, something about, you know, good, healthy sports parenting. There's so many great organizations out there. I love to watch you play.com. They've got so many articles that, you know, Asia Mates constantly putting out. I've got a few articles sharing those things, but also if you say you value something, then, then value it. So in there, you know, have the character or the value award, whatever it is that your, your team's mantra, yeah. give it a shout out, you know, specifically, you know, Johnny was phenomenal this week and he stayed after and he cleaned up in the locker room and, you know, he's just had such good attitude. Give, give that one kid a shout out. You know, that, that's a big, big thing that we've seen. And I've seen coaches go as far as to provide this, some detailed scouting reports that the team they're having. Just like, hey, we got a, this opponent and this is some of the obstacles. They're really good at this and that. And share a little, even a little bit of strategy. You know, like, like it, some parents really, really enjoy that. So the, there's the, the weekly email. I would also say the individual messages. Like just literally having a checklist of every kid. And, and I would say at least once a month one of your coaches, head coach or assistant coaches, should be connecting with those parents about something positive because so often the interactions are negative. So, and it could just be a text message. It could be an email. It could be a letter. It could be just walking up to them at, the, at a game or a match and just saying, hey, you know, we're really noticing this about your son or your daughter, and they're doing a phenomenal job of this. So acknowledging those things is a big thing. Uh, that takes time, but – if you're organized in a way, it really shouldn't take that much time. I mean, to send a text, but we're sending text messages all the time, you know? So that's one thing. I encourage, uh, I encourage coaches at their parent meeting to open the door on the communication. To say, typically it's like, hey, these are the things I won't talk about. I encourage five conversations I do want to have. One of those is, 
you know, saying, you know, parents, I need you to contact me. I need you to let me know when there's something going on at home that, that could be impacting your son. I need to know when your son come to would be, I need to know when your son is coming home and is not enjoying his experience. Like he's just miserable. He's really down or something like that. So, you know, conversations like that, we want them uh, to come have. I encourage, um, you know, us being really clear on our, how we determine playing time as a coach and then us communicating that consistently to the players. So we have a lot of stuff around playing time that we have in place, but we, 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 we say the parents where I encourage coaches to say, if you don't understand why your child is not playing and it really bothers you and it's festering, then come talk to me. You don't have to agree with us, but if you don't really understand, because my whole, I just don't want the parents up there in the stands, you know, developing that because the parents are part of our culture. They really are. They're a part of our culture. And we've, we've got to start seeing that. If we exclude them, we try to exclude them, they're still impacting the culture, what they're saying. So i uh, just trying to constantly um, meet them where they're at. And one I, I encourage, you know, the coach to communicate is when your opinion of me as a person has changed. Like, hey, you can think I'm a bad coach, but if I've done something that's been you consider to be demeaning or demoralizing or, you know, hurtful to your son or daughter, then you come talk to me about it. You know, like I'd want to know that. I don't want that feedback so that I could at least try to help make things right. And I, I, I say those things because I've screwed up so much. Like I've had moments where I've, as a coach, I've heard a kid, he's gone home and it's festered for a while. And then it comes out later that I said something which I didn't realize it was taken that way. And I'm like, dang, if I'd only known, if I'd only known. Now, kind of as we're, you know, wrapping things up here a little bit, JP, if there's one piece of advice that you would give coaches for connecting with players, what would it be? It really, it comes down to the relationships. And to do that, I would have, um, whether I had 10 players or 100 players, I would have a one-on-one -on -one checklist that we would need to be charting how often we're having intentional one-on-ones. Now, it doesn't need to be like coming to my office, let's sit down and let's have a serious chat. It, but it's making sure that we're having those collisions for at least two to two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. And sometimes it's more of a sit down one. This is before practice, after practice, on the bus, in the stands. This is in your office, in the classroom, in the hallways, pulling them aside and really engaging and having active listening. Listening where we're fully immersed in that experience with our body language, our tone, we're asking questions that are, that are open questions that are probing for more information. Uh, using some of our other stuff around tactical empathy, uh, some of those strategies, but just really diving in on those conversations. Uh, I think that's so, so, so important that we're really intentional about that. And so I, I have coaches that have, they have a roster and coaches need to get around to certain guys. Um, you know, you look at the great coaches out there, like the, the Greg Popovich, San Antonio Spurs. I mean, it, it, before practice, I mean, what has he seen doing? He's seen going up there, wrestling with guys, get in there really close, a lot of physical contact, just, just really connecting with them. And I think we cannot, we cannot do that enough in our programs. So being really, really, really sneaking intentional about it, that's my biggest recommendation.